but are next on 5.9 8.4 favorite features and added functionality my name is chelsea grover and i'm the marketing communications coordinator for attentive i'd like to take a moment to explain the process for today's presentation first i'd like to mention that this webinar will be recorded we'll send out a copy of these slides and the recording within the next week Next, for those of you who aren't familiar with Itenif, I want to share a bit of who we are with you. We specialize specifically in next-gen healthcare. We're passionate about providing solutions for our healthcare provider partners, which in turn help them to improve patient care, enhance the patient experience, and maintain a financially healthy practice. To sum it up, we do everything next-gen. And we also have two add-on productivity solutions for next-gen, ShortGuard and Refund Manager. Next, we have a number of webinars planned that we're pretty excited about. I won't go over them all, but I do want to point out that in response to requests for demos at UGM, we're going to be doing a live demo of our next-gen add-on product, Refund Manager, a week from today. Refund Manager auto automates the arduous process of credit balances and refunds in next-gen. If you want to see how this product can take a very time-consuming and manual process and turn it into a few clicks of the mouse, please join us then. You can register for that on the Events and Education page of our website. In two weeks, we're going to be presenting an educational webinar on the 2018 QPP Final Rule. The Quality Payment Program is highly complex, and the 2018 Final Rule clocks in at 1,653 pages. Don't worry, though. Our subject matter expert understands it all and wants to help you understand the program changes as easily as possible. Join us for this webinar to get a better grasp on the Final Rule and the impact it will have on your practice. We're also going to be offering some more next-gen specific webinars in January, so keep your eyes out for those. Okay, so back to today's webinar on the 5984 upgrade. At the end of the presentation, we're going to open the floor up to questions from you. We'll answer all the questions at the end, but you can type them in the questions area of the webinar control panel whenever they occur to you. And finally, for audio clarity purposes, everyone's phone will remain muted throughout the entire webinar. If you experience audio issues, please use the chat box to let us know so we can resolve them. And again, questions may be entered in the questions box. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. Lindsay Lanning is our Healthcare Compliance Consultant at Itenif, and Cindy Kincaid is Vice President of Client Solutions at Itenif. And Adam Boron, Solutions Manager at Itenif, will also be available for questions at the end. Adam acted as our boots on the ground, assisting a beta client with their upgrade, so he'll be great for questions. So Cindy, the webinar is all yours. Take it away. All right, thank you. Well, what we want to talk about today are the next gen 5984 favorite features and added functionality. This is certainly not going to cover everything that's available in this in this upgrade, and it does not cover anything when UD3 or KBM8311. So for those of you who are still on versions earlier than that, you will also, as you plan to upgrade, want to review those features. First thing about 5984 is it's a combined release. This is the first time NextGen has made it a requirement that you, if you are upgrading to either one of these options or you're looking for features in either one of these options, you must take this as a combined upgrade. So that was an experience. We've had clients do that before, and it's really not all that different. And there's a lot of positives that we found to doing this, and it ha wasn't as painful as I think some of you might think. First of all, if you upgrade to KVM84, you must upgrade to 5.9 and vice versa. What this gives you, though, is one go live, it's single downtime, single training, and consolidated testing. Uh, the releases both are required for certain regulatory requirements next year, but it also does much, much more, and we'll be talking about that now. So I'm going to focus on EHR enhancements today, and there are quite a few of them, and some of them we're really excited about. The topics we'll be working on are spell check, alerts, changes to the medication module, allergies module, problems module, orders, immunizations, patient education, the portal, PHI log, care plan, social history, and HQM measures. The first and foremost one we want to talk about is spell check. Every time I've seen this presented in any, any presentation, either, either at NextGen or by ourselves or with the clients that we've brought live on this product, this is, this is one of the highlights. I think people have been looking for this forever, so I think we've made a pretty good representation here of how nice this is going to be in terms of using this with EHR. Bell check and KBM templates, modules, inbox, tasks, patient portal messages, and more. So the screenshot that we're showing you shows from a template and then in the notes field where you can put in and how it will be implemented into that particular area. 
This can be enabled at the practice level, and it can also be enabled as, as a preference in the user. It's standard, it uses a standard medical dictionary, and the spell check options allows users to set up preferences and dictionary options, such as your own words, and you can see an example is that you can ignore words with certain numbers, internet addresses, email addresses, etc. So you have the ability to set up variables based on the user as well as in system practice configuration. It can also be turned off at a user level. We have had questions about how does it impact performance, and you may have heard something about this. We'll be going through that in our lessons learned, but honestly, those were early on in the beta process, and it, we are not experiencing any difficulty with performance on this, and the users that are live actually love it. This is one thing people have been waiting for for a very long time. Alerts. The alerts have been greatly enhanced and improved. So when a patient's chart is now open, any alert marked for acknowledgement appears for the user, even if another user has already acknowledged it. So you're going to be able to see those. They're marked with a flag and do not appear again for the same user in the same session. So that's also helpful in terms of seeing those same things over and over again. To acknowledge multiple alerts, users can click each alert row once. The flag checkbox has been relabeled to pop up for acknowledgement and the add edits alert window. The unflag label has now been changed to acknowledge, and the unflag and close button has been removed. Those were always sources of confusion in, in alerts, and by making these changes, they feel that it's more in line with what you would see in other software and applications. There's also a new privilege setting that provides the users the ability to snooze alerts. And what this means is it allows a user to snooze or delay the display of alert for a specified duration, 24, 48, or 72 hours. So if you have a follow-up or something you want to do and you followed up on it, you don't, maybe don't want the alert to go away until it has been resolved, but you also don't necessarily want to have to see it every time you go into the chart or you go into looking at some of the, some of the responses and follow-ups on a particular patient. Two new alerts were also added for comfort measures and hospice care to the chart category for selections on the add edit alerts window. And these were just, again, uh, additional options to make available to you that were becoming more and more as we, as we move into different treatments and different cases of care. In the medication module, the RX fill enables the fill status of prescribed medications to be viewed in the medication module. Participating pharmacies can now send medication fill information back to the provider, and it will now be viewable from the RX fill status column in the medication module. Both the prescriber and pharmacy must be enrolled in the SureScript service level in order to have this functionality. The new RX fill history window displays all successful RX fill status messages for a medication. So to view the information of the dispensing of the medication in the past, the user can right-click on a medication to see the status history. The Rx status column now displays prescription fill statuses for each medication based on the pharmacy messages received. These are dispensed, not dispensed, partially dispensed, no status and not participating. This has been one of the more popular items that's been added to the to this through this version update because it gives you a better idea of what the status of your refill requests are. The medication reconciliation checkbox has now been upgraded to have an added checkbox in the medication module. It must be selected for each encounter where it's performed and it's synced with the checkbox on the medication panel of framework templates. So this is really just an, an, another added functionality and able to be able to ease, more easily reconcile your meds. To meet regulatory standards of the medication module now requires you to electronically prescribe oral liquid medications in the metric standards of millimeters. Again, just a change. There's no additional setup required for this. The system alerts you when an inappropriate unit of measurement is being used you will now help, you will have to manually update existing oral liquid medications, orders, and favorites. And this will not affect any of your user-defined medications. So this is, again, just new functionality to adhere to requirements, particularly as it relates to these types of medications. 
In the allergies module, the patient information bar, and in the workflow module, the table header reaction in the table that appears when a user hovers with the cursor over the allergies button is replaced with reaction severity. Again, this is based on requests from users to make it more logical and more meaningful in terms of how it is displaying. The updated reaction section now provides the ability to associate severity to a reaction instead of with an allergy. And the new add reaction severity window will allow you to define the allergy reaction and the severity of the reaction. The separate severity field has been removed. Once again, this functionality in the past had a lot of comments about it because allergies, it was very, very much subjective. And now it gives you more ability to define what the reaction is and how the impact is on the patient. And you're adding these, adding these particular allergies. Also in the allergies module, when you're adding allergies using a KBM template, the user will use the same tick list as the module. However, it does not have a field for severity. So you want to keep that in mind in terms of how you're recommending to be adding these in this version. In the allergy panel on the KBM templates, the reaction column has been updated to include the severity. Changes to the problem, problems module have been incorporated, so the user now has the ability to document comorbid conditions through the comorbid condition checkbox. As is added note, the comorbid condition column must be added through the grid preferences, so there is some, set, some minor setup associated with that. Users can now enter ordering reasons for lab and radiology orders. This will allow the providers to document why a test is performed. There is a new field added to the new order entry window called ordering reason. This is a free text field. When the user sends the order, the system will also send the ordering reason. So while it is free text, it will be included in the order. You now have the ability to incorporate confidential lab delegates. This is enabled on the lab radiology tab and practice preferences order module. And when a provider logs into EHR, the following lab delegate option will be available. So what you can do is you can go in, add and allow confidential lab delegates. Then once this is done, the provider will now be able to assign users as delegates to review confidential labs. This is just, again, assisting in the follow-up and being able to move forward with different types of orders. And that was highly requested. So this has also been a very popular one with the uh, clients that we've brought live in this version. The order module and patient portal, users can now send corrected lab results to the patient portal if the practice is enrolled. You can do this by right-clicking on an amended result in the HR order module or the PAQ and select details to portal. This will only be applicable to patients with completed enrollment status that can receive these results. But this has also been one that was highly requested for those physicians and practices that were attempting to send orders to the patients and be able to update them with any corrections that were made. So once again, very highly, highly requested and very favorably received. In the immunizations module, for more accurate immunization documentation and reporting, users can indicate that a patient has not received any immunizations by checking the no known immunization history checkbox. The checkbox was added to the order module immunization tab, and it populates on CCDA if checked. If a patient has received immunizations, the no known immunization history checkbox does not appear. The immunization module can determine appropriate next due immunizations and verify that a patient's immunization series is complete. For each administered immunization, the system calculates the next due date and a status based on the minimum dose interval and the minimum age. This supports clinicians and decisions about when to administer immunizations to patients based on the CDC child and adult immunization schedule. The NDC is required when sending an immunization to a registry that has been administered. With 5984, NDC is now validated before being sent to a registry. The NDC validation is based on first data bank. If the NDC is not valid, the following will populate. If the NDC number is not long enough, the following will populate. So you can see the examples there. And then the ND and an NDC crosswalk has now been added.
Immunization status changes. Users can easily identify the specific status of a vaccine. The immunization status will now display in the order description on the order summary tab description column instead of having to open the order. It will show the status in parentheses, as we have an example here. The order status is now administered rather than completed. And you're gonna see throughout the application, we may not have some of them there, that some of the verbiage has been changed to administered or completed you know, versus completed because that's a, that can be variable in terms of definition. Uh, the reports will now reflect the status change. Changes to patient education ha have been uh, implemented and the patient education browser now includes external sources in addition to internal sources. This was highly requested because a lot of people in a lot of groups we work with perhaps don't use the HealthWise. They have other types of options and other things that they may bring in. The default source is initially set to internal though, so that's important to keep that in mind. The user can now launch the patient education browser from the left-hand navigation by clicking the button. This will pull up suggested education documents depending upon what is documented in the patient chart. So that's also really cool. I've looked at a lot of different things and what that allows you to do is it will basically, depending upon the criteria that you put in the chart, it will give you suggestions as opposed to having you just go out and look for what type of education. That is largely dependent on HealthWise though because it's gonna be using those type of things. So I wanna make that clear as well. Patient education in the patient portal. So users now have the ability to send multiple patient education forms via the portal. That's basically just an enhancement enabling you to send more documentation to the, to the chart and also now to the portal. Patient portal messaging has been incorporated to secure messaging. There's now a new contains clinical information checkbox in the compose reply window. Providers need to check this to increment the numerator for the ACI and the meaningful use measure credit. If it is checked, it is checked by default in the HR, however, it is not checked by default in PM. This is also very, very purposeful in terms of being able to identify that a message does have clinical information and just for purposes, not only just for the meaningful use of ACI, but it's also HIPAA and you know, PHI requirements. So this is actually um, added functionality in the portal and you're gonna be seeing a lot more of these types of things as the portal continues to enhance. There's now a category column called, called category, and it has been added, added to the communication inbox. So for every patient-initiated message, it displays the message category selected by the patient while composing the message. Looking at the portal and a presentation yesterday, and it's, it's actually a really nice functionality that the patient can now select us through a menu option, and then it can send it over to you. So again, just allows you to better categorize or keep your messages separate and also route them to the appropriate personnel by utilizing this functionality. PHI log for referrals and transition of care. The users have the ability to, to attach a specific referral to the disclosure of the PHI and the PHI log. Again, just an added functionality to, to this uh, capability that was already there. Care plan. Care plan streamlines, streamlines care planning by grouping elements of care planning into one spot. This is convenient since the care plan represents multiple plans of care and includes information such as a health concern, care team members, assessments, statuses, goals, outcomes, and care plan history. This is available in the left-hand navigation or as a sub-navigation link. This allows you to be able to prepare for patients that are coming in and prepare for your day, and it's added functionality. I don't want to call it necessarily the morning huddle, but for those of you who participate in those type of things or that you are doing any type of population health or quality care measures, this gives you the ability to basically prepare for your patients and get an advanced start on your treatment plan for them. Tobacco use has been enhanced. There's a new panel for documentation of vaping uh, use under social history in tobacco. That's kind of minor. I never thought I would see that. Uh, I've been around for a long time and we've laughed quite a bit about that, but now you are documenting vaping and that is considered part of your tobacco, tobacco use documentation. 
There's also added functionality for social determinants of health. Under the social histories, the user can now document any social determinants of health through active text. So you'll see the added, the active text window on the screen, and then you can go through and move and document these areas by moving from that area more easily and with less clicks and also with added functionality and more capabilities based on the changes in the requirements. There is also now the capability of entry of patient-generated health data. So you want to think of this as a Fitbit template, and it really is. Now, there are some challenges of this, and we can talk more about this in greater detail, but what this allows you to do is that you can go in and you can actually log in and put data coming in from, from a, you know, a Fitbit is, is the one that they really focused on, but there's also Apple Watch and other capabilities. There are some security enhancements by moving into that website that they're probably going to be looking at in the future. So I would want to, before you really embark on this, take the time to learn and understand what it is. But it's very cool as we move more in more and more into this level of healthcare and being able to look at telemedicine and some of the other ideas of being able to have your patients populate and participate in their own healthcare. The HQM measures have been updated significantly. Users can view information pertaining to the status of completed, non-completed measures based on applicable value-based programs. So they've made this a lot easier. I know that Lindsay is not presenting this part of it, but we've done a lot of HQMs and was very excited about this particular functionality as she works quite a bit with our uh, clients on their quality measures and their uh, macro measures and all of the things that they're doing with, with the regulatory requirements. So this has made it a lot easier and looks a lot better and, and allows you more functionality associated with it. You now have the ability to do HQ measures on a patient level view. And again, allows you to be able to dig deep, go in, see if you're not understanding your numbers or if something's not looking and you can actually go out and view specific patients. So if again, very at great added functionality, making it easier to follow up, monitor, and make sure you're on track with your measures. And you can see the HQ measures on provider level view. And that's also, again, very nice because you can look at the variables. You can see how you're doing. You can see how you're performing on a provider level and also on a competitive level sometimes. Sometimes health when providers can see how they're doing. And then you can also look and see how they compare to other providers. So it's added a really nice dimension to being able to look at your HQM measures. So now, we're moving on to the EPM enhancements. I'm going to turn it back over to Lindsay, and I may be interjecting here as there are some really exciting functionality associated with EPM in this version. Some of it, I think, is really going to make everybody really, really happy. At least it did me. So, Lindsay, take it away. Great. Thank you, Cindy. Um, thanks for taking us through so many of the EHR features this upgrade has to offer. Like I said, it's not all of them. Um, Similar here, we're going to look at the EPM enhancements found within this 5984 upgrade. We won't cover them all, uh, but some of the topics that we will look at are going to be the demographic enhancements, um, looking at gender identity and race and ethnicity upgrades, uh, privacy notice alerts, appointment scheduling added functionality, recall and follow-ups, and then ending things with charge entry. So to start off, we're going to look at a general enhancement, which now allows the user access to the success community in PM by simply clicking on the web browser icon on the patient information bar. So as you can see, this will launch the browser with buttons at the top for NextGen, the success community, and the NextGen Clearinghouse. I think this integrated functionality saves the user a lot of time by not having to actually click out of the session, open up a separate internet browser, and navigate to this page. Um, you can also access the success community from the help or about next gen on the pm login screen as well so two different places this was added uh, again just for quicker access and allowing ease to access different education documents and things like that the end user may need to look at moving on to the add modify patient information window first off there is a new vertical layout found along the side for increased ease when you're navigating to the tabs listed and then specifically looking at the demographics tab on the add modify patient information window, it now displays the patient portal enrollment status icon by the patient photo, which is on the left-hand side now. 
there actually are new hypertext links for previous last name and first name, which will appear as a magenta color if they have data in them, and then a blue color when they do not. And by clicking the link, the user can actually add a previous name, and by hovering over the link, the data that's already entered will just display. The secondary address is now actually a radio button, giving the user the option to switch between the billing and secondary address information, which is nice. Um, and then the contact information section now allows the user to disable or clear a contact method field by selecting that NA checkbox. So what this will do, it'll gray out the field and it will work even if the field required. Now in that same section, the international contact information has been moved to the international hypertext link. And that follows the same rule as the previous last and first name. If it's magenta, it has information included in there. And if it's blue, it does not. Also, rather than an insurance button, the insurance now displays on the patient demographic window. This means less clicks and easier navigation to quickly reference the insurance without having to actually open it up. And lastly, certain SOGI fields have been added to the demographics tab, which we'll go over in more detail later. But those include gender identity, sexual orientation, preferred pronoun, and current gender. So, I mean, overall, kind of my take on this is that the demographics tab really just got a facelift to better the end user experience. Yes, and I, I would agree from that perspective. This is, what, what you'll see as we go through these enhancements is that PM had a much larger facelift than EHR did in this particular version because largely uh, KBMA 311 had the big, more impact on EHR and most of the, enhancements in EHR were regulatory, but I think you're going to see some really exciting things in this, and this has been really well received. Our clients that are on this love the new demographic screen and the ease and ability to move from place to place. Definitely. Um, so going off of that, one specific feature about ease of navigation that we wanted to actually highlight is that vertical layout. So it's important to note that practice or chart level information will only save if a chart is created or already exists. So that actually includes any information on the privacy tab, any relation or role data that's been entered, as well as any pharmacy details. So I want to note for a person record, some of these tabs actually won't even be available. What this means is that some of the information needs to be saved to the chart. And if the person you're adding the demographics for doesn't have a chart, you won't be able to see it. You won't actually be able to save it. And you'll get this message that you see on the screen. So for instance, the privacy tab data will not be saved unless you create a chart, create a chart and continue. And then you have the option to just click yes right here or no or cancel. Moving on to another tab found on this vertical navigation and that's pharmacy. This new tab allows the user to add up to two pharmacies in the PM chart. So before you never used to be able to add pharmacies from the PM side, now you can. This will make e-prescribing much easier on your clinical staff because they won't have to worry about adding pharmacies. They should already be in the chart. The last tab we will look at is the chart details. It is a new tab and previously this was only found in the patient's chart. It's still there, but now the user can access it here as well. And this is great because it essentially allows the user to enter information at the chart level for a patient that could then apply to individual encounters without having to go into the patient's chart. Really, it just makes it easier and allows the user to make it a part of the auto flow as well. All right, so a few slides ago, I mentioned that new SOGI fields were added to the demographics tab on that patient information window. Well, going back and taking a deeper look at this, let's start by defining what SOGI even means. SOGI stands for Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity. And on the Modify Patient Information pop-up, you can now actually select birth sex, which was changed from sex, current gender, which is new, gender identity, sexual orientation, and preferred pronoun, which are all also new as well. Now you might be asking, what are the differences between these new fields? How should they be used? And how are they set up? Well, if we look at birth sex versus current gender, sex is renamed to birth sex, and this is referring to a patient's biological sex at birth. And the new current gender field refers to the gender as which the patient is currently living. There is a new code table and file maintenance for current gender, whereas the previous code table for sex still remains.
Now in NextGen, birth sex will default to match current gender. This can be unchecked in practice preferences. I do want to point out that it applies to only male and female and not undifferentiated. Now, if you have a patient in which their current gender is different than the birth sex and you modify the record, a prompt or alert will display. Essentially, the Modify Patient Information Demographics tab now prompts you to confirm when birth sex or current gender is modified at all. For example, if birth sex and current gender are female in NextGen, and I try and change the current gender from female to male, but the birth sex is still female, the system will ask me, do you also want to change the birth sex then? And that's that pop-up you're seeing. Basically, it's confirming with the provider. Are you making the change because it was entered into the system incorrectly or because there was a change with the patient's current gender? Now, if we look at other places within NextGen that gender and sex fields have been updated or added, let's start with reports. Previously, the columns on the report used to be gender and gender description. Now they're actually sex and sex code. Also, when searching for potential duplicates, the verbiage has been changed to read last name, birth date, and sex, where it used to say last name, birth date, and gender. And lastly, in the appointment book, where users can see male and female symbols, these symbols actually pull from birth sex. So an appointment book preference has been added to choose to display the icons or not. I do want to note that the sex icon suppression only applies to the daily view in the appointment book. Taking a closer look at gender identity, gender identity is a code table in file maintenance and the user is able to hide ones not being used, but they can't change or add a code. They can, however, change how it's displayed in NextGen by modifying the descriptions. For example, choose not to disclose can actually be renamed to decline to specify. The code table actually dictates the options available in the demographics window gender identity dropdown. And within that dropdown, there's an additional gender category users can select. If the user selects this option, it will prompt a new window allowing the user to free text, and that's the screenshot you're seeing on the screen. So while users can't add new gender identity codes, they can select the additional gender category option and free text. And don't worry, this will not add it to the code table. Now, if you're worried about users using the additional gender category option and allowing them to free text for gender identity, you can hide that option in the code table. And then finally, looking at preferred pronoun, this tells clinicians how the patient wants to be referred to. So his, her, him, et cetera. This is a master list in file maintenance and it's changeable. Now, if the user navigates to Enterprise Preferences Client Defined, they can actually make all SOGI fields required. You can decide if you want the SOGI fields to appear on the General tab or the UDS tab. You can even privatize gender details by making it a link on the General tab. Now, I will point out the default is to display the SOGI fields on the general tab, and that's how it'll come. Um, otherwise, you do need to make these changes yourself. And lastly, in the insurance maintenance on the detail two tab, in the insurance card name override section, there's now a sex field in addition to the alternate name fields. This will actually override current gender and allows the user to submit a claim with the sex that the insurance knows the patient as without having to change it in NextGen. So we should all be familiar with this Detail 2 tab and with this section um, where it actually overrides the name. They just added a field here for sex as well. Okay, switching gears a bit um, and looking at race and ethnicity changes. Meaningful Use Stage 3 and the Medicare QPP requires users to have the ability to collect multiple ethnicities. So all races will now actually be categorized automatically during this upgrade. This is a result of a new standard that requires each one of the patient's races and ethnicities to be aggregated into the categories that are set up by the OMB race and ethnic standards. They're basically used for federal statistics and administrative reporting. So 
so race and ethnicity are both master files in file maintenance. So you will want to go in and review the race and ethnicity master list and unhide the ones you want to track. So on the end user side of things, um, those are really back end changes. What the end user will see was that they now have the ability to multi-select and reorder ethnicities. And you're seeing that ethnicity drop down where you now have check boxes. Now, for a feature that we may be used to, but in my opinion has been greatly improved, is the privacy notice alert. Prior to 5.9, users were only alerted if a privacy notice is on file or not. As an updated practice preference, users can now have the system notify them if a privacy notice was issued or received within a specified number of days. So I think this will help practices become more efficient in collecting these notices and keeping them on file. Now, if we look at appointments, uh, there is an added calendar quick advance functionality. Users can quickly jump forward two weeks, three months, or six months using links added to the change dates calendar on the appointment book toolbar and on the recall plan maintenance window. Essentially, this allows the user to advance the calendar date with fewer clicks. This has been a long time coming. We're shocked it honestly took this long to include because it will make a world of difference when you're scheduling a patient for a follow-up four weeks or seven months later. I mean, this is just another example of something little making a huge difference for the end user in a positive way. Staying within the appointment book, users can now see EHR follow-ups in the appointment window. So follow-ups entered in the EHR will actually be visible on the recall waitlist tab. And that blue push pin icon lets users know there is a follow-up order. Previously, when a provider entered a follow-up order in the EHR, you couldn't see it in PM. Now you can. Before, you would have to send a task or you would have to have a patient tell the front desk staff, which isn't always reliable. Now, when users schedule a follow-up appointment, they would go to the recall tab and see the order right there. The end user would then schedule the follow-up visit based on the order. Once the appointment was scheduled, they can actually right-click on the follow-up order and auto-update the order in EHR with appointment information. This is effectively closing the loop on the order and letting the clinical staff know the appointment has been made. There's also the added ability to archive letters with recalls included in enterprise preferences. And from the recall window, uh, you'll notice a few new buttons were added, such as new, open, stop, and then that letters button actually has a drop down to view and print letters. And one of our last favorite features on the PM side is the enhanced usability to reorder diagnoses on charge entry, just simply by clicking that reorder DX link. So instead of a user having to delete all the diagnoses out and re-enter them in the correct order, they can use this new functionality. This is another one that's been a long time coming. I cannot tell you how well received this has been simply because of the time savings, because there's always a need to be reordering these diagnoses and the way you had to do it was so cumbersome. Definitely agree. Um, so the, now that we've actually gone over our favorite features included in both EHR and PM, those really focus on functionality and overall creating a better end user experience. Let's go ahead and just look at a handful of Medicaid meaningful use and Medicare ACI enhancements we're going to see in this new version. So while well, yes, there are a lot of changes related to the 2015 EHR certification included in this release, it is by no means the only reason you should consider upgrading. There are a ton of other regulatory compliance issues besides the certification addressed in this upgrade including the Radiology Appropriate Use Criteria, or AUC, for Medicare, the new ben Medicare Beneficiary ID numbers, and also prescription drug monitoring program updates. All of that, obviously, in addition to the added or upgraded functionality we just went over on both the EHR and PM side. Now, if we look at some of these non-certification-related compliance topics that are also addressed, one of them is the Social Security Removal Initiative. 
This is required by MACRA, and it basically requires the removal of Social Security numbers from Medicare beneficiary ID cards. So in NextGen, to mask the Social Security numbers, the user will need to go under Practice Preferences and that General tab and check the Display Last for SSN on Person Lookup Results. If it's not checked, that Social Security number will not be masked. If it is masked, then you're going to see the Social Security number masked on the Person Lookup, the Guarantor Lookup, the Account Profile, Chart, History tab, the Modify Patient Information window, and even Reports. Another area of compliance is prescription drug monitoring programs. This upgrade allows for two-way communication with state-controlled medication databases, or PDMPs. The new PDMP button actually enables the user to query the state drug monitoring registry from the medication module, and it'll actually bring back a report on the patient's drug monitoring program. This is an extremely important tool to combat the national opioid crisis and also help prevent patients who may be shopping around for prescriptions by seeing multiple providers from obtaining these controlled medications. And then we also have the appropriate use criteria, or AUC, which is, again, another mandate by CMS for users when ordering radiology advanced imaging tests. So advanced imaging tests include CTs, MRIs, and PET scans. This will give users appropriate use feedback when placing radiology orders in the EHR orders module. The system will actually calculate an appropriateness score for the advanced imaging test. And this AUC rating is between one and nine. And the practice actually sets up a specific score threshold, which will determine when the pop-up for recommendations will appear. And this process occurs immediately after the user selects an advanced imaging test on that create new radiology order window and it provides feedback to make more informed clinical decisions before ordering radiology tests. It improves order accuracy, and it ensures the most appropriate study for the patient's medical condition is being selected. So how NextGen did this is they partnered with the National Decision Support, Inc. to provide access for clients to the ACR Select CDS engine from within the EHR. So like I mentioned, based on clinical factors captured within the patient record, this tool will provide an appropriate use score for the selected test. So this actually enables the provider to view and select tests with a higher appropriate use score. Now, the provider can always bypass the recommended score and proceed with ordering the original test if they want to. Just keep in mind, the identifier obtained from this CDF engine will actually be stored with the order and will appear on the order requisition. Along those same lines, another clinical decision support tool that was added is the ability to add or modify vital signs references. So they did this by adding a new NextGen KBM vital signs practice template that supports clinical decision support requirements. And then looking at just a handful of the ACI or meaningful use requirements that I think will benefit users regardless of program participation and those involve the patient portal. So first off, there were some patient portal visual updates. There was a color change from blue to orange for visually impaired. The fonts were updated to be larger and darker. There's also status tracking for CCDAs now. So NextGen actually receives a message delivery notification as confirmation of successful CCDA transmission or if it was a failure. This confirmation of receipt is actually required in Meaningful Use Stage 3. And then there's now this also added functionality to CC a patient when sending a CCDA. NextGen Share can actually send a copy of the CCDA to a patient's patient portal account. And for all of you re reporting under meaningful use or ACI who track that, this will also count for you and increase the secure messaging objective as well. So here's the patient view if they were to be copied on a CCDA from Share. Basically, it lets the patient know they've been copied on the CCDA sent to another practice and that it's a no reply message. This is just another way patients can play a larger role in their own care. They can have a greater sense of awareness of where their data is being sent. And they can actually hold their providers accountable now.
Also, with this new upgrade, patients can send a CCDA from the portal to unsecured emails. So the patient would log in and go to My Chart or View My Chart. They would click the Send button, and then the I want to send to someone else is a new option. So this allows patients to transmit health record information to a private email address. So think at a gmail.com address or at a yahoo.com address, any of those. Now, don't worry. Um, if your patients do choose to do this, the chart is sent as a password protected zip file. So when their recipient tries to open the attachment, they will be prompted to enter the password. Ideally, the patient should verbally call the intended recipient with the password. Continuing on here with sending and sharing CCDAs, 5984 has a new transitioning into care template. Providers here can actually indicate that a patient was transitioned into care and that a summary of care document was requested and received. Here's a screenshot of that template. Uh, it really acts as a record of all the CCDAs in and out. It puts what has been sent out and received all in one spot instead of opening each one on the patient history toolbar. So essentially, it's just a snapshot showing you the to and from fields, the document description, the practices involved, dates, et cetera. And lastly, we have the CCDA viewer. So this viewer is enhanced to support the custom view, which includes clickable table of contents, a display pane for presentation and readable sections, and user-defined filters. So this custom viewer enables the user to filter the display to selected sections within the document, set a preference for the display order of specific sections, set the initial quantity of sections to be displayed, and even perform a CCDA validation on the document. Users can access this from the patient history toolbar, uh, generate CCDA button and templates, and also the PAQ. So here's a screenshot of the viewer. You can see again, users can quickly navigate to the section of data they need to review. Uh, they can control the order in which the sections display and determine the sections that will actually display by default as well. So if after all of this information we went through today, you're uncertain where your practice stands, uh, let us help not only with your 5984 upgrade, but with anything related to the health of your practice. We can assess your current readiness, provide recommendations, and help implement new processes and procedures. If you are wondering what your next step should be, go ahead and visit us at attendant.com. Continue to sign up for these informative webinars. We do have a few next-gen webinars on our list to hit up in January, so please attend those. Um, consider our three-day fixed-price on-site consultations for clinical workflow, revenue cycle in front office, as well as technology and performance. And don't forget to test drive our products. Okay, we've made it to questions. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Chelsea for any questions those of you on the call may have. Hey, Lindsay. Great. Thanks so much. And Cindy, thank you for your help as well. And Adam, I'm sure that you're going to have to jump on to answer some of these questions as well. As a reminder, you can type questions in the questions area of the webinar control panel. And if you happen to think of them after the fact, feel free to reach out to either Lindsay or Cindy. You see both of their information is up on the screen. We'll be happy to help you then as well. Uh, so a number of people are asking if we can send out slides to this. Yep, we would be happy to. We'll be sending out a copy of the slides as well as a link to the recording within the next week. So keep your eyes out for that. We also always post on the social media as well. Okay, so first question. Can you print the med list from the med module? Adam, do you want to answer it? Yes, uh, yes. unfortunately, um, this functionality was not added in the 5984. Um, so you would still have to print it the other ways that you currently print out the medication list. Okay, thanks, Adam. Next question. Will checking hospice in alerts exclude patient from ACO measure document denominators in HQM per CMS measure guidance? I can take that one. Uh, Adam and I were actually IMing about that one, and because it is an alert, it's informational, and we both do not feel it will have any impact on the measures themselves because they don't communicate to the HQM uh, module. Great, thank you, Cindy. Uh, for the CQM, do you have to be using NextGen's HQM features to use this? Yes, Adam, uh, to... uh, the HQM or the CQM icon in EHR, you do have to use the NextGen HQM portal um, in order to use this. Great, thanks, Adam. 
Uh, next question. Is there something we need to turn on to get the PDMP button? I have 5984 in my test environment and I don't see that button. Uh, yes, in practice preferences, there is a section under medications um, that you have to enable the PDMP and then there's also a, a username and password that you have to have um, and that's, that's signed up through the PDMP. Great, thank you, Adam. Uh, will documents provided using the external education links count for the ACI measure? To I my knowledge, yes. One. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, was gonna say yes, they will. So <laughs> that's been added. Um, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Those, those will increment but your you numerator have, if you use that instead of internal as well. And you have double confirmation there. Great. Thank you, ladies. Next question. We heard that the CDS requirement was delayed until 2020. Is that true as far as you know? I can grab that one as well. Um, yes, it was delayed. So as of right now, it's not like your claims will be rejected because it's been delayed to 2020. However, CMS is starting to test. So the sooner you have that functionality in place and you're actually sending the claims correctly with that AUC um, number rating on there, uh, you'll be ahead of the game as well as CMS already starting to test that functionality and it'll prevent your claims from being rejected in the future. Great, thank you, Lindsay. Looks like we have another question about the slides. Again, I will be emailing them within the next week. If you don't happen to get them though, sometimes they do go into people's spam boxes and there's nothing that I can do about that. Uh, so if you don't get them, feel free to reach out to either Lindsay, Cindy, you can reply back to any of my previous uh, invitations and we'll make sure that we send them to you uh, personally just in case they happen to get automatically thrown back due to email issues. Next question. On the referral order template, the checkbox next to the CC the patient via the patient portal, does this count towards the HHIE meaningful use measure? I can grab that one. Um, it won't actually count for the HIE measure um, if you're copying the patient. So by sending the CCDA out to another practice, that will increment your HIE measure. By copying the patient on it, that'll actually increment your secure messaging measure. Your HIE measure should automatically be actually incrementing upwards or increasing just because you're sending it regardless. But copying the patient, again, will actually increase your secure messaging. So killing two birds with one stone, if you will. Okay, sounds great. Thank you, Lindsay. Next question. What's the difference in the medications with the PDMP and the download medications features? Will they pull different patient data? Yes, I can take that one. Um, so the PDMP, uh, that's through APRIS Health. There's uh, currently 43 states that participate in it. Um, there's uh, the other 70 not. Uh, this is uh, the cost for this is per provider that you have to register through APRIS. Um, it does pull potentially some different information, uh, but it still is using the patient information in order to find the pharmacies or the prescriptions that they've had filled. Thank you, Adam. Next question, and it looks like this might be the last. So if you have a burning question, we still have a few minutes, so feel free to ask. Is it a practice? Is it a practice preference or permissions to view the success community embedded link in PM? You know, I Adam, I'm not sure. Yeah, I. Um, I believe it's I'm a. Not... I believe it's a preference, but I'm not sure if it also has the ability from a uh, permissions perspective. We will look that up and get back to you. Okay, thanks, Cindy. Uh, next question. Does this version have a pre-visit planning tool? I can see the care plan is not really pulling onto the immunizations or other screenings that may be due for the patient. Um, I can take that one. So there is a, a pre-visit templates that are available in the EHR. Um, that you can definitely utilize to be able to document ahead of time, um, as well as certainly doing a chart um, chart update or chart abstraction, depending on the patient. Yes, the pre-visit planning is, is very similar to like a, a morning huddle, so you can utilize that with your reports and you can actually go in, put some information in advance, and it creates a template that the provider can actually look at. So it's kind of a summary document, a very popular and very well received. Follow-up question to that, uh, does it autofill? I would 
need to know what you mean by autofill. Yes, I think that I might have does. misread the first question, Cindy. <laughs> I, I think that she was saying, I can see that the care plan is not really pulling info on the immunizations or other screenings that may do for the pa that may be due for the patient. Oh, okay. So, out so of is I'm the information pulling now. through all the way? Yeah. Yeah, that uh, that I'd have to um, take a look. Let's research that. We'll research that and get back to you. But reading it differently puts a different spin on it. Yeah, my apologies for that. I think that. Oh no, that's I, okay. I was should. I mean, I, I'm seeing it myself, so I, I heard it like you read it. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll research and get back to you on that. Good question. Okay, well, it looks like that might be it. But again, uh, you know, if, if questions occur to you later, uh, Lindsay or Cindy's information is up there. You can reply back to my emails when I send out the links and the recordings uh, within the next week. Any way that you can get a hold of us, we're happy to help. Thank you all for joining us today. And uh, we hope to see you at our next one. Remember that a week from today, we are doing Refund Manager. So you can see how we can automate. And definitely. Refund. Yeah, go ahead, Cindy. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Chelsea. Definitely. Oh, that, that webinar, but also keep in mind the one for the um, lessons learned on this because we did a lot of beta sites and everything. That's going to be a very informative one as far as the 5984 and UD3. That's right. That's so going to be in January. Yeah. In January, we're doing yep. another one on the lessons we learned from, from uh, doing these beta practices. So we hope to see it that one as well. well. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day and happy holidays. Bye, everybody.